Section 11 of Highways in Hiding by George O. Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 As the miles separated me from the Macklins, my mind kept whirling around in a tight circle. I had a lot of the bits, but none of them seemed to lock together very tight. And unhappily, too many of the bits that fit together were hunks that I did not like. I knew the futility of being non-telepath. Had Mr. Macklin given me the truth, or was I being sold another shoddy bill of goods? Or had he spun me a yarn just to get me out of his house without a riot? Of course, there had been a riot, and he'd been expecting it. If nothing else, it proved that I was a valuable bit of material, for some undisclosed reason. I had to grin. I didn't know the reason, but whatever reason they had, it must gripe the devil out of them to be so unable to erase me. Then the grin faded. No one had told me about Catherine. They'd neatly avoided the subject. Well, since I'd taken off on this still hunt to find Catherine, I'd continue looking, even though every corner I looked into turned out to be the hiding place for another bunch of mad spooks. My mind took another tack. Admitting that neither side could rub me out without losing, why in the heck didn't they just collect me and put me in a cage? Damn it, if I had an organization as well-oiled as either of them, I could collect the president right out of the new White House and put him in a cage along with the King of England, the Shah of Persia, and the Dalai Lama to make a fourth for bridge. This was one of those questions that cannot be answered by the application of logic, reasoning, or by applying either experience or knowledge. I did not know nor understand. And the only way I would ever find out was to locate someone who was willing to tell. Then it occurred to me that, aside from my one experience in housebreaking, that I'd been playing according to the rules. I'm pretty much a law-abiding citizen. Yet it did seem to me that I learned more during those times when the rules, if not broken, at least were bent rather sharply. So I decided to try my hand at busting a couple of rather high-level rules. There was a way to track down Catherine. So I gassed up the buggy, turned the nose east, and took off like a man with a purpose in mind. En route, I laid out my course. Along that course, there turned out to be seven way stations, according to the highway signs. Three of them were along U.S. 12 on the way from Yellowstone to Chicago. One of them was between Chicago and Hammond, Indiana. There was another to the south of Sandusky, Ohio. One was somewhere south of Erie, Pennsylvania, and the last was in the vicinity of Newark. There were a lot of highways themselves, leading into and out of my main route, as well as along it. But I ignored them all, and nobody gave me a rough time. Eventually, I walked into my apartment. It was musty, dusty, and lonesome. Some of Catherine's things were still on the table where I'd dropped them. They looked up at me mutely, until I covered them with the walloping pile of mail that had arrived in my long absence. I got a bottle of beer and began to go through the mail, wastebasketing the advertisements, piling the magazines neatly, and filing some offers of jobs which reminded me that I was still an engineer and that my funds wouldn't last indefinitely, and went on through the mail until I came to a letter. The letter. Dear Mr. Cornell, We're glad to hear from you. We moved not because Marion caught Mextrums, but because the dead area shifted and left us sort of living in a fishbowl, sigh-wise. Everybody is hale and hearty here, and we all wish you the best. Please do not think for a moment that you owe us anything. We'd rather be free of your so-called debt. We regret that Catherine was not with you. Maybe the accident might not have happened. But we do all think that we stand as an association with a very unhappy period in your life, and that it will be better for you if you try to forget that we exist. This is a hard thing to say, Steve, but, really, 
all we can do for you is to remind you of your troubles. Therefore, with love from all of us, we'd like to make this a sincerely sympathetic and final farewell. Philip Harrison I grunted unhappily. It was a nice-sounding letter, but it did not ring true somehow. I sat there digging it for hidden meanings, but none came. I didn't care. In fact, I didn't really expect any more than this. If they'd not written me at all, I'd still have done what I did. I sat down and wrote Philip Harrison another letter. Dear Philip, I received your letter today as I returned from an extended trip through the West. I'm glad to hear that Marion is not suffering from Mextrum's disease. I am told that it is fatal to the uninitiated. However, I hope to see you soon. Regards, Steve Cornell. That, I thought, should do it. Then, to help me and my esper, I located a tiny silk handkerchief of Catherine's, one she'd left after one of her visits. I slipped it into the envelope and slapped a stamp and a notation on the envelope that this letter was to be forwarded to Philip Harrison. I dropped it in the box about eleven that night, but I didn't bother trying to follow it until the morning. Ultimately, it was picked up and taken to the local post office, and from there it went to the clearing station at Pennsylvania Station at 34th Street, where I hung around the mail baggage section until I attracted the attention of a policeman. Looking for something, Mr. Cornell? Not particularly, I told the telepath cop. Why? You've been digging every mailbag that comes out of there. Am I? I asked ingenuously. Can it, Buster, or we'll let you dig your way out of a jail. You can't arrest a man for thinking. I'd be happy to make it loitering, he said sharply. I've a train ticket. Use it, then. Sure. At train time, I'll use it. Which train? He asked me sourly. You've missed three already. I'm waiting for a special train, officer. Then please go and wait in the bar, Mr. Cornell. Okay. I'm sorry I caused you any trouble, but I've a bit of a personal problem. It isn't illegal. Anything that involves taking a perceptive dig at the U.S. mail is illegal, said the policeman. Personal or not, it's out. So either you stop digging, or else. I left. There was no sense in arguing with the cop. I'd just end up short. So I went to the bar, and I found out why he'd recommended it. It was in a faintly dead area, hazy enough to prevent me from taking a squint at the baggage section. I had a couple of fast ones, but I couldn't stand the suspense of not knowing when my letter might take off without me. Since I'd also pushed my loitering luck, I gave up. The only thing I could hope for was that the sealed forwarding address had been made out at that little town near the Harrisons and hadn't been moved. So I went and took a train that carried no mail. It made my life hard. I had to wander around that tank town for hours, keeping a blanket watch on the post office for either the income or the outgo of my precious hunk of mail. I caught some hard eyes from the local yokels, but eventually I discovered that my luck was with me. A fast train whiffed through the town, and they baggage-hooked a mailbag off the car at about a hundred and fifty per. I found out that the next stop of that train was Albany, I'd have been out of luck if I'd hoped to ride with the bag. Then came another period of haunting that dinky post office. I've mentioned before that it was in a dead area, so I couldn't watch the insides, only the exits. Until at long last I perceived my favorite bit of mail emerging in another bag. It was carted to the railroad station and hung up on another pickup hook. I bought a ticket back to New York and sat on a bench near the hook probing into the bag as hard as my sense of perception could dig. I cursed the whole world. The bag was merely labeled forwarding mail in letters that could be seen at 90 feet. My own letter, of course, I could read very well to every dotted I and crossed T and the stitching in Catherine's little kerchief. 
but I could not make out the address printed on the form that was pasted across the front of the letter itself. As I sat there trying to probe that sealed address, a fast train came along and scooped the bag off the hook. I caught the next train. I swore and I squirmed and I groaned because that train stopped at every wide spot in the road, paused to take on milk, swap cars, and generally tried to see how long it could take to make a run of some forty miles. This was fate. Naturally, any train that stopped at my Rattleburg would also stop at every other point along the road where some pioneer had stopped to toss a beer bottle off of his covered wagon. At long last, I returned to Pennsylvania Station just in time to perceive my letter being loaded on a conveyor for LaGuardia. Then the same damned policeman collared me. This is it, he said. Now see here, officer, I... Will you come quietly, Mr. Cornell, or shall I put the big arm on you? For what? You've been violating the disclosure section of the Federal Communications Act, and I know it. Now look, officer, I said this was not illegal. I'm not an idiot, Cornell. I noted uncomfortably that he had dropped the formal address. You have been trailing a specific piece of mail with the express purpose of finding out where it is going. Since its destination is a sealed forwarding address, your attempt to determine this destination is a violation of the act. He eyed me coldly as if to dare me to deny it. Now, he finished, shall I read your chapter and verse? He had me cold. The Disclosure Act was an old ruling that any transmission must not be used for the benefit of any handler. When Rhine came along, Disclosure Act was extended to everything. Look, officer, it's my girl. Hoping that would make a difference. I know that, he told me flatly. Which is why I'm not running you in. I'm just telling you to lay off. Your girl went away and left you a sealed forwarding address. Maybe she doesn't want to see you again. She's sick, I said. Maybe her family thinks you made her sick. Now stop it and go away. And if I ever find you trying to dig the mail again, you'll dig iron bars. Now scat. He urged me towards the outside of the station like a sheepdog hazing his flock. I took a cab to LaGuardia, even though it was not as fast as the subway. I was glad to be out of his presence. I connected with my letter again at LaGuardia. It was being loaded aboard a DC-16 headed for Chicago, Denver, Los Angeles, Hawaii, and Manila. I didn't know how far it was going, so I bought a ticket for the route with my travel card, and I got aboard just ahead of the closing door. My bit of mail was in the compartment below me, and in the hour travel time to Chicago, I found out that Chicago was the destination for the mailbag, although the superscript on the letter was still hazy. I followed the bag off the plane at Chicago and stopped long enough to cancel the rest of my ticket. There was no use wasting the money for the unused fare from Chicago to Manila. I rode into the city in a combination bus truck less than six feet from my little point of interest. During the ride, I managed to dig the superscript. It forwarded the letter to Ladysmith, Wisconsin, and from there to a rural route that I couldn't understand, although I got the number. Then I went back to Midway Airport and found to my disgust that the Chicago airport did not have a bar. I dug into this oddity for a moment, until I found out that the Chicago airport was built on public school property, and that according to law, they couldn't sell anything harder than soda pop within 300 feet of public school property no matter who rented it. So I dawdled in the bar across Cicero Avenue until plane time, and took an old propeller-driven conveyor to Eau Claire on a daisy-clipping ride that stopped at every wide spot on the course. From Eau Claire, the mailbag took off in the antediluvian conveyor, but I took off by train because the bag was scheduled to be dropped by guided glider into Ladysmith. At Ladysmith, I rented a car, checked the rural routes, and took off about the same time as my significant hunk of mail. 
Nine miles from Ladysmith is a flag stop called Bruce, and not far from Bruce, there is a body of water slightly larger than a duck pond called Cali Lake. A back road decorated with ornamental metal signs led me from Bruce, Wisconsin to Cali Lake, where the road signs showed a missing spoke. I turned in, feeling like Ferdinand Magellan must have felt when he finally made his passage through the strait to discover the open sea that lay beyond the New World. I had done a fine job of tailing, and I wanted someone to pin a leather medal on me. The side road wound in and out for a few hundred yards, and then I saw Philip Harrison. He was poking a long tool into the guts of an automatic pump, built to lift water from a deep well into a water tower about forty feet tall. He did not notice my arrival until I stopped my rented car beside him and said, Being a mechanical engineer and an esper, Phil, I can tell you that you have a... A worn gasket seal, he said. It doesn't take an esper engineer to figure it out. How the heck did you find us? Out in your mailbox there is a letter, I told him. I came with it. He eyed me humorously. How much postage did you cost? Or did you come second-class mail? I was not sure that I cared for the inference, but Philip was kidding me by the half-smile on his face. I asked, Phil, please tell me, what is going on? His half-smile faded. He shook his head unhappily as he said, why can't you leave well enough alone? My feelings welled up and I blew my scalp. Let well enough alone, I roared. I'm pushed from pillar to post by everybody. You steal my girl, I'm in hocus with the cops, and then you tell me that I'm to stay up the proverbial estuary lacking the customary means of locomotion, he finished with a smile. I couldn't see the humor in it. Yeah. I drawled humorlessly. You realize that you're probably as big a liability with us as you were trying to find us? I grunted. I could always blow my brains out. That's no solution and you know it. Then give me an alternative. Philip shrugged. Now that you're here, you're here. It's obvious that you know too much, Steve. You should have left well enough alone. I didn't know well enough. Besides, I couldn't have been pushed better if someone had slipped me. I stopped, stunned at the idea, and then I went on in a falter. A post-hypnotic suggestion. Steve, you better come in and meet Marion. Maybe that's what happened. Marion? I said hollowly. She's a high-grade telepath, master of psi, no less. My mind went red as I remembered how I'd catalogued her physical charms on our first meeting in an effort to find out whether she were esper or telepath. Marion had fine control. Her mind must have been positively seething at my invasion of her privacy. I did not want to meet Marion face to face right now, but there wasn't a thing I could do about it. Philip left his pump and waved for me to follow. He took off in his jeep and I trailed him to the farmhouse. We went through a dim area that was almost the ideal shape for a home. The ring was not complete, but the open part faced the fields behind the house so that good privacy was ensured for all practical purposes. On the steps of the veranda stood Marion. Sight of her was enough to make me forget my self-accusation of a few moments ago. She stood tall and lissom the picture of slender, robust health. Come in, Steve, she said, holding out her hand. I took it. Her grip was firm and hard, but it was gentle. I knew that she could have pulped my hand if she squeezed hard. I'm very happy to see that rumor is wrong and that you're not suffering from Mextrum's disease, I told her. So now you know, Steve. Too bad. Why? Because it adds a load to all of us, even you. She looked at me thoughtfully for a moment, then said, Well, 
Come on in and relax, Steve. We'll talk it out. We all went inside. On a divan in the living room, covered by a light blanket, resting in a very light snooze, was a woman. Her face was turned away from me, but the hair and the line of the figure and the... Catherine. She turned and sat up at once, alive and shocked awake. She rubbed the sleep from her eyes with swift knuckles and then looked over her hands at me. Steve! she cried. And all the world and the soul of her was in the throb of her voice. End of chapter 11